happy show. I, I posted this story um, from the griot.com. And uh, this story is from uh, stories from today dealing with Amber Geiger. Amber Geiger, we remember uh, Dallas, former Dallas police officer Am Amber Geiger uh, in 2020 shot and killed both them, John, in his apartment and thought it was hers. Well, in August of 2020, uh, Amber Geiger's attorney filed a um, filed an appeal to her conviction and they were trying to get her conviction uh, overturned, et cetera. All right. Well, we have an update on that story. That didn't turn out too well. And when the appeal was filed, I told people this is just routine. People were going crazy. And how could she and all this stuff? I'm like, dude, a lot of uh, probably the majority of people who get convicted of murder file an appeal trying to either get a new trial or try to get the, try to get it overturned or something like that. This is routine. It's, I mean, you know, we stress over the wrong thing, to tell you the truth. That's just routine. So we have an update uh, on Amber Geiger. And then today is the 56th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act, 1965 Voting Rights Act, signed into law by uh, President uh, Lyndon Johnson. So there was an article from BlackAmericaWeb.com that deals with how the Voting Rights Act was signed on this day 56 years ago, 56, uh, was signed on this day uh, 56 years ago, and it remains under attack. It remains under attack. And this is something, you know, we've been talking about here on this show, the attack on the Voting Rights Act, voter suppression laws, tying this into history. And we see... Uh, we, we see the voter suppression is connected to the history of African-Americans in this country, going back to when the 15th Amendment of 1870 was uh, adopted. We see right after that tactics being put in place to um, we see tactics being put in place to uh, suppress our vote. OK, so we'll discuss that as well. Then today, uh, in addition to this being the uh, anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act, it's also the anniversary of Jamaica winning its independence from Great Britain, August 6, 1962, August 6, 1962. And there was an article from um, the Washington Post saw an article from the Washington Post that talks about how on Jamaica's Independence Day, uh, women's sprint team, Jamaica's women's sprint team, caps dominant Olympics with four by 100 gold. OK, uh, Jamaica's uh, women's sprint team caps Olympics with four by 100 gold. So we'll talk a little bit about that. The uh, the members of the team, Elaine Thompson, Hera. Uh, Hera uh, Shelly Ann Frazier Price, Sharika uh, and Sharika Jackson. And uh, we've been watching them in the Olympics. And uh, many people, ma many of us have been cheering for everybody black, you know, <laughs> regardless of which country they're from. And, you know, one of the things I like about the Olympic is, is you get to see African people from all around the world. You get to see uh, black people from all around the world. OK, representing different countries and they represent the african diaspora so we'll talk um about uh, uh jamaica's independence day and we'll talk about uh jamaica's women's sprint team winning the uh olympic four by 100 uh race they won the gold medal on jamaica's independence day uh there was an article from the amsterdam news uh, about Renoko Rashidi. Now, you know, we told you back on, um, well, he passed away Monday, August 2nd. We talked about this Tuesday, August 3rd. But most of this week, we've talked about uh, uh, Renoko Rashidi. He passed away 
uh, historian and anthropologist Ren Renoko Rashidi passed away Tuesday, August 2nd, uh, while in Egypt on a tour. And th there's an article from Amsterdam News by Herb Boyd, Detroit's own Herb Boyd, um, that pays tribute to uh, Renoko Rashidi. Uh, it's entitled Renoko Rashidi, Intrepid Scholar of the Global African Presence. Renoko Rashidi, Intrepid Scholar of the Global African Presence. So we'll talk uh, some about that piece uh, as well. And then uh, on Saturday, well, this weekend, you know, I, I teach uh, my online classes. So uh, Saturday, it's from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power. 1865 to 1968 that's saturdays uh 3 p.m to uh 5 p.m and then uh on sunday uh was it 2 p.m to 4 p.m i teach uh ancient kemet the moors and the maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach them in school okay so you can visit our website africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com um, you can register for the online courses there. These are 10 week online courses. We do them online. We do them live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. Um, and from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power is a brand new, uh, class that I'm teaching. It picks up where the uh, first one leaves, leaves off. Okay. So we'll post a link here. You can visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. But I'll post the link here. You can register uh, for the course here as well. It's regularly $130 on sale, $80. And then all, this, uh, uh, all the sessions are archived after we do them. So you can go back and watch them over and over again. You still have access to the class even after the class is over with. But at the end of the show, we'll, we'll give a brief uh, preview of uh, the content of the class. Now, on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now it's corrects wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or a woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events in history, politics, education economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter or visit our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com. All right, I want to jump into this uh, first story. We're going to go to clip one here in just a second, Ed. Um, so Amber Geiger. Now, when I first heard uh last year, last August, uh, when I first heard that uh her attorneys were filing an appeal, uh trying to either overturn the conviction or get a new trial or what have you, I was I was not phased one bit because I know the process and I know um you know that's what happens, that's how it goes, and I also knew that. Uh, she was not going to get a, a new trial. Her conviction was not going to be overturned as well. I wasn't worried about that at all. At all. Uh, and I remember I was trying to calm down people on social media, people going crazy. You know, how could she, how dare she, all this. I'm like, you know, <laughs> I'm like, this, this is a lot of stuff to worry about. This ain't anything to worry about. Okay. Um, I, I want to go to this clip here. This is from, um, uh, this is from NBC News, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, NBC News, Dallas, Fort Worth, the NBC News affiliate. Now, this clip is from last year. This is from August 7th, 2020, dealing with Amber Geiger's defense appeals wants conviction on lesser charge and both them John killing killing. Uh, let's go to clip one. Uh, Ed. Botham John's mother says she is furious tonight over Amber Geiger's appeal. The former Dallas police officer wants a court to overturn her murder conviction 
and 10-year prison sentence for killing Jean in his own apartment. Jean's mother told Scott Gordon that if anything changes, Geiger should get a longer sentence. I feel curious about this, I'll tell you. Both from Jean's mother, Allison John, speaking from her home in St. Lucia, reacting to Amber Geiger's appeal. It really made me question the nerve of Amber Geiger and her attorney to even think of wanting to file an appeal. In a long legal brief, Geiger's attorneys argue it was a mistake to convict Geiger of murder, claiming the charge should have been criminally negligent homicide. When they bring these things, lame issues, it really shows that they have, you know, they, 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 they've gotten, they, they're low. They have very low for Amber Geiger. Geiger was sentenced to 10 years after an extraordinary trial full of raw emotions. The former cop had just arrived home, still in uniform, after a long day at work. She says she shot John, believing he was an intruder in her apartment, not realizing she had mistakenly walked into his. And can you kill someone in the comfort of their home and just say, I'm sorry, just have an apology, and you just get away with it? I mean, where in the world does that happen? The John family's attorney says he doesn't think the appeal will be successful. I don't think there's anything new. Uh, within the brief, uh, I think the jury had the, all the evidence uh, that was before them, and I, I think the, the right decision was made. Angry over the appeal, Botham John's mother says she and her husband can't celebrate their wedding anniversary, even as others call to congratulate them. In the one call that I cannot get is from my son, Mopa. I'm in pain. It's hurting. And the family may have to relive their pain again and a lawsuit against Geiger and the city, still in its early stages. Scott Gordon, NBC5. Okay, so that's from uh, NBC Channel 5, NBC Dallas-Fort Worth, uh, the affiliate there. So uh, I want to go to uh, clip two. Clip two deals with uh, the appeal being denied. Let's go to clip two, Ed. Appeal, appeals court upholds former Dallas officer Amber Geiger's murder conviction. Uh, let's go to clip two. You can take it off mute. Conviction overturned. The Texas appeals court ruled her conviction and 10 year prison terms should stand for the shooting death of her neighbor, Botham John, three years ago inside his apartment. Geiger wanted the appeals court the, uh, to change her sentence to criminally negligent homicide, and that would have triggered a new court hearing and a new possible punishment. She testified that she had mistakenly walked into the wrong apartment and shot and killed John. Okay, so that is an update from um, CBS Dallas Fort Worth, uh, the CBS affiliate there. That's from August 5th, 2021. So, as the uh, piece from uh, the griot.com uh, shows, the court upheld her conviction. Texas court rejects Geiger's appeal of Botham John murder conviction. Okay, as I told people, you know, she's gonna stay in prison. She, you don't have anything to worry about. Okay, not on this. Now there's some other stuff to worry about, but this ain't one of them. Okay, I got 99 problems, but she ain't one. I'm telling you right now, we'll deal with this on the other side of the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstation Future Radio. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. Stand by. All right. If you'd like to sign up for information, you can support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Okay, stand by. We'll be back in a couple minutes here. And this is our official Cash App account. Dollar sign the AHN show. S H O W. Okay. And it shows my name there, Michael, and it shows my picture. These other ones are fake uh, African History Network Cash App accounts. Stand by. We're back from break in, in uh, three minutes.
All right, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. We're back from break in a couple of minutes here. When we come back, we'll talk about this story dealing with Amber Geiger. Then we'll talk about um, the anniversary of the Voting Rights Act and how it's still under attack. All right, stand by, everybody. Nine ten a.m. Superstation, a division of Adele Media. The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and/or the persons appearing on the program, and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Nine Ten AM Superstation or Adele Media. Welcome back to the African History Network. Nine Ten AM Superstation. However, with our Godfather package, two hundred spots for only five hundred dollars, with a must air within thirty day policy. That is only $2.50 per spot. And we'll even produce the spots for free. That's right, for free. For more information, call Renisha Williams now at 313-434-8291. Now let's return to our regularly scheduled programming. All right. Thank you. I was about to read the spot, but okay. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 910 AM Superstation Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. M. Hotel, with the help of Ed, our engineer tonight. Uh, 313-778-7600 is the call in number 313-778-7600 this is, is the call in. 313-778 is the call in number if you have a question or comment 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment all right so right before the break i, I was talking about this story here and you got a lot of people uh, I mean, this got like over 1,300 likes on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. I posted this uh, today. A Texas court rejects uh, Amber Geiger's appeal of Botham John murder conviction. Okay. Texas court rejects appeal of Botham John murder conviction. So um, it's routine. If somebody's convicted of murder, okay and they're sitting there in prison it's routine for their uh, attorney to file an appeal trying to either get a new trial try to get the sentence reduced i mean that's what defense attorneys do i mean that's that's what they do so a panel of three state judges ruled that a dallas county judge uh, a, a dallas county has sufficient evidence to convict amber geiger of murder in the 2018 shooting of Botham John. So uh, a tech, the Texas uh, appeals court on Thursday upheld the murder conviction of former Dallas police officer who was sentenced to prison for fairly shooting uh, uh, her neighbor, Botham John. Uh, a panel of three state judges ruled that a Dallas County jury has sufficient evidence to convict Amber Geiger of murder in the 2018 uh, shooting the decision by the fifth texas court of appeals in dallas means amber geiger who turns 30 years old uh on monday uh will continue to serve the uh 10-year prison sentence will continue to serve the 10-year prison sentence uh and largely dashes her hopes of having the 2019 conviction overturned she will uh, be eligible for parole in 2024 under her current sentence. Okay, now the ruling comes in a case that drew na national attention because of the strange, strange circumstances. Because it was one in a string of shootings of African American men by white police officers, and we talked about this here on this show. And this was a good example of why you need to get like the facts before you start uh, hallucinating uh, scenarios. Because, you know, you had people who just wanted to hallucinate a relationship between the two of them that didn't exist. 
And uh, S. Lee Merritt, who was uh, one of the family attorneys, said they went through and they went through text messages, emails, telephone records, things like this. They couldn't find a connection between he and uh, Amber Geiger, no relationship, anything like that. You had people that just want to hallucinate a reality that didn't exist. And then, and then they said they wanted a fair trial. They wanted to just make up stuff. You, you, you had people, somebody went on his Instagram account, took a picture of him with three white ladies, circled one of the pictures, put it on social media, said that was Amber Geiger. That wasn't Amber Geiger. That was a co-worker. You just accused somebody innocent of murder. But this is, you can't just make stuff up. We have to be more responsible with social media. So the ruling comes in a case that drew national attention because of the strange circumstances and because it was one in a string of shootings of African-American men by white police officers. Now, the appeals court, the, uh, the appeals court justices did not dispute the basic facts of the case. Amber Geiger returning home from a, a, a long shift mistook uh, John's apartment for her own which was on the floor directly below his finding the door ajar she entered and shot him later testifying that she shot that she thought she shot a burglar now there was a difference in the affidavit that she gave to the dallas police department in the affidavit she gave to the texas rangers there was a difference in the account of what happened and that right there caught her up right there when i read the difference i read both affidavits when i read the difference in what she was testifying to or swearing to the account of what happened I, I knew right, right from there i knew she was going to prison now both of john 26 years old was uh he was an accountant he had been eating a bowl of ice cream before amber geiger shot him she was later fired from the dallas police department okay geiger's appeal hung on the claim that her mistaking both of john's apartment for her own was reasonable and therefore uh so too was the shooting okay she 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 claimed that her mistaking his apartment for hers was reasonable and therefore so too was the shooting now let's keep this just back up now also she fired at a silhouette in the dark what what police training uh, what police training are you citing that teaches you to fire at a silhouette in the dark and you don't know what you're shooting at she said that that was also what happened now her lawyer her, her her attorney uh asked the appeals court to acquit her of murder or substitute in a conviction for criminally negligent homicide okay her her uh her attorney asked for the court to acquit her of murder or substitute in the uh, or substitute in a conviction for criminally negligent homicide which carries a lesser sentence so dallas county prosecutors counted the error the error countered that the error was not reasonable that amber geiger acknowledged intending to kill john and that quote murder is a result oriented offense end quote all right so the court's uh chief justice robert d burns and uh justices uh lana myers and robbie partita kipnis concurred with uh they concurred with uh, prosecutors disagreeing with Guy Geiger's belief that the deadly force was uh, was needed was reasonable. Uh, in the 23-page opinion, the justices also disagreed that evidence supported a conviction of criminally negligent homicide rather than murder. And they pointed to Amber Geiger's own testimony that she intended to kill. All right. You can read the rest of this here, but she's going to stay in prison. I told people that's what was going to happen. All right. There's nothing to worry about here. And there's some other stuff we need to worry about. Okay. I voter suppression, coronavirus, 
I got 99 problems, but this which ain't one. I said which with a W. Okay. I got 99 problems, but this which ain't one. Texas court rejects Geiger's appeal of Botham John murder conviction. Read this at the grill.com. That's from August 6, 2021. Okay, now, um, today is the 56th anniversary of the signing of the Voting Rights Act, signed in the law by uh, President Lyndon Johnson. And the Voting Rights Act is, uh, as we have all been paying attention, hopefully, is under attack, under unprecedented attack. You have 389 at least 389 voter suppression laws in um in uh 48 state legislatures at least 389 voter suppression laws in 48 state legislatures okay and we know that there have been i think 30 laws passed 30 laws that have been passed in about 18 states already so there there is a piece from uh, blackamericaweb.com as well as newsone.com um from august 6th we're going to take a uh um and then we'll take a look at that in just a second but let's look at some history dealing with uh the voting rights act so there's a piece from history.com history.com is the uh official website of the history channel and uh, they have a piece here. President Johnson signs a uh, Voting Rights Act. OK, uh, President Johnson signs a uh, Voting Rights Act. So uh, we'll look at this piece first and then uh, we'll go to the one from uh, Black America Web. And we know the history of Selma, Alabama and all that ties into this history. Bloody Sunday, March 7th, uh, 1965. Before that, the killing of Jimmy Lee Jackson, uh, all this ties into this history. So on August 6, 1965, uh, President Lyndon Baines Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act guaranteeing African-Americans the right to vote, guaranteeing African-Americans the right to vote. Now, the bill made it illegal to impose restrictions on federal, state and local elections. The bill made it illegal to impose restrictions on federal state and uh local elections okay um and we we know that you needed this you needed things like the voting rights act because of what happened in 1876 in texas with the texas state constitution of 1876 the mississippi state constitution of 1890 the Louisiana State Constitution of 1898, grandfather clauses of 1898, etc. Now, uh, in in if you look at the uh, article from the Washington Post that deals with uh, the Mississippi uh, the Mississippi plan, this plan instituted in Mississippi was adopted by other southern states south carolina alabama things like this the mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890 we came here to exclude the negro we came here to exclude the negro you've heard me talk about this before and these are things that we deal with in the uh, new 10-week online course that i teach that looks at history from 1865 the year the civil war ended and child slavery ended through 1968 um, and briefly here if we look at this they talk about the convention president judge uh county judge solomon saladin calhoun he was a white county judge and he put the voting issue bluntly now in 1890 the majority of the population in mississippi was african-american and this is before the great migration that starts in about 1915 so 90% of African Americans still live in the South, okay, at, at this point in time. This is um 35 this is um 25 years after the Civil War ended, all right? And 90% of African Americans still live in the South. 
uh, let's tell the truth if it bursts the bottom of the universe, he said. We came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this will answer. They're trying to put in place laws to suppress the African-American vote. Now, this is uh, after Reconstruction ended. OK, this is 13 years after Reconstruction ended in 1877. Uh, Hiram Rhodes Revels, who was the only U.S. senator from the state of Mississippi who was seated in 1870, he's already left the U.S. Senate. But delegates eventually adopted a literacy test and poll tax geared to suppress the black vote in a state with a black majority. Th these white people wanted to suppress the African-American vote in a state that had a, the majority of the population was African-Americans as a legacy of slavery. OK, this is the chickens coming back home to roost on you. OK, you enslaved us. Now you surrounded by us. The Mississippi plan became the model throughout the south a uh throughout the south part of a raft of racially oppressive jim crow laws that ended reconstruction and, and reconstruction ended in 1877. so when we look at the uh voting rights act of 1965 this is what you needed it in place okay you you're dealing with the aftermath of 1890 and then in 1898, you have a U.S. Supreme Court case, Williams versus Mississippi. In this U.S. Supreme Court case, the poll taxes and literacy tests are being challenged in U.S. Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court rules that it does not violate the 15th Amendment to have the poll taxes and literacy tests. So the U.S. Supreme Court upholds these obstacles to the 15th Amendment. They ruled that it, it does not violate the 15th Amendment. So these are things that the, the 1965 Voting Rights Act is addressing. And then the 65 Voting Rights Act is then going to be attacked again by the U.S. Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court case of Shelby County versus Holder, 2013, which, which uh, struck down Section 5, which dealt with the preclearance, the oversight. And immediately after that supreme court ruling within 24 hours states started passing new voter id laws voter restriction bills and then we see the attack at the state legislature level continuing today so you have people like john hope bryant who says uh operation hope john hope bryant and you see him on uh he's been on roland martin unfiltered before and then he was uh other other shows and he, he he deals with uh financial literacy and building your credit and things like this and he says that uh, uh neighborhoods that have uh 700 credit scores or better they don't they don't have riots they don't rebel things like this well they don't have riots in the street see white people attack you in the courts and the state legislature that's where they have their riots that's where they have their rebellions january 6 rebellion that was that was unusual usually they attack you in the courts and they attack you in the state legislatures and also they attack you in the house of representatives and the senate but is really the but the attacks really take place at the state level because of states rights and they take place in the courts the federal courts okay federal courts of appeals u.s supreme court so we're looking for rebellions in the street, but the rebellions are taking place in the courts and the state legislatures because they're passing laws that then negatively impact us. So it don't matter what your credit score is. They attack you in the courts and the state legislature. So we have to understand this so we can practice political self-defense and understand how to defend ourselves against these attacks. OK, now. Mississippi's 1890 convention sought to find a way around the 15th amendment to the u.s constitution the 15th amendment of 1870 which gave african-americans the vote so initially it's african-american men then after the uh 19th amendment of 1920 which guaranteed the right to vote to women then it's going to be extended to women african-american women now just two decades earlier the mississippi state legislature had made history by electing 
uh, Hiram Rhodes rebels to the U.S. to the U.S. Senate. OK, that was the Mississippi State Legislature, because at this point in time, the average voter did not vote for U.S. senators. For about the first 126 years, U.S. senators were appointed by the state legislature. It wasn't until 1914 that people started voting for U.S. senators. People didn't vote for U.S. senators at this point in time in 1890. It was the state legislature that appointed U.S. senators. And if I remember correctly, they were appointed to a 10 year term. He was the first African-American member to serve in either the House of Representatives or the, uh, either the House or Congress. Uh, the, the, uh, either he, I'm sorry. He was the first African-American member to serve in either House of Congress. But that moment of racial progress quickly vanished. And here's a picture of Hiram Rhodes Rebels as well. He was an African-American preacher and educator. He was elected to the U.S. Senate. OK, well, he was he was appointed by the state legislature to the U.S. Senate from Mississippi to become uh, the first African-American member of Congress. After President Rutherford B. Hayes removed all federal troops from the southern states in 1877, white Democrats who had supported slavery and the Confederacy began be, began regaining control of the states from African-Americans and white Republicans. Nearly all of the Mississippi Convention's 134 delegates were white Democrats with one African-American Republican, okay? That was, um, uh, he was the mayor of Bayou. Uh, 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 it was um, Isaiah T. Montgomery. Isaiah T. Montgomery voted for the poll taxes and literacy test against african americans he was he was african american he's an african american man isaiah t montgomery was the founder of bayou mississippi the city of bayou mississippi and he was the, this is this is a picture of isaiah t montgomery he was the founder of bayou mississippi and the mayor of bayou mississippi he was a wealthy african american landowner okay he voted along with the white supremacists against his own people now you know, it was it was going to be they had enough votes to pass the, the, the to pass the constitution anyway. But still, why are you gonna vote along with them? He he reminds me of Senator Tim Scott, a uh, uh, Black Tea Party Republican from uh, South Carolina. That's who that's who he reminds me of. I'm not sure if they're related. I'm I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised if they are. But that's who he reminds me of. Uh, a white Republican named Marsh Cook had campaigned for a seat vowing to protect the rights of black voters a few weeks before the convention his bullet ridden body was found on a rural road okay read the rest of this article here that so he was killed he he was um uh he was a white republican marsh cook who was trying to protect the rights of african americans he was killed The Mississippi plan to keep blacks from voting in 1890. We came here to exclude the Negro from the Washington Post. So this is why you needed a Voting Rights Act of 1965. This is why you need a Voting Rights Act of 1965. And here we are again. It's all under attack and they're trying to take it away from us. So. On August 6, 1965, President Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act, guaranteeing African-Americans the right to vote. Now, Johnson assumed the presidency in November 1963 after the assassination of President Kennedy. Uh, in the presidential race of 1964, President Johnson was officially elected in a landslide victory and used this mandate to push for uh, legislation he believed would improve the American way of life, which included stronger voting rights. Uh, which included stronger voting right laws. Now, a, a recent march in Alabama in support of voting rights during which African-Americans were beaten by state troopers shamed Congress and the president into passing the law. That was Bloody Sunday, March 7, 1965. And John Lewis was there. John Lewis was the only member of SNCC there. Uh, Hosea Williams, Dr. King was not there for that particular march. He's going to be in uh, March a couple weeks after that. But he wasn't there. Dr. King wasn't there on Bloody Sunday. Um, shamed Congress and the president into passing the law 
meant to enforce the 15th Amendment of the Constitution ratified by Congress in 1870. In a speech to Congress, March 15, 1965, President Johnson had outlined the devious way in which election officials denied African-American citizens the vote. African-Americans uh, attempting to vote were often told by election officials that they had gotten the date, time, or polling place wrong, that the officials were late or absent, that they possessed insufficient literacy skills or had filled out an application incorrectly. Oftentimes African-Americans were, uh, oftentimes African-Americans who, whose uh, population suffered a huge rate of illiteracy due to centuries of oppression and poverty would be forced to take literacy tests, which they inevitably failed. Now, What's interesting is that when you look at Tuskegee, Alabama, in Tuskegee, Alabama, they had African Americans had a higher literacy rate than white people in Tuskegee because of Tuskegee Institute. Okay, where you know where um, Booker T. Washington was, the Tuskegee Institute. We know Booker T. Washington passed away in 1915. Okay, two years after Harriet Tubman passed away. Now, in Tuskegee. The state, well, in, in, I should say, in the state, in the Alabama state legislature. In 1957, they gerrymandered the district in Tuskegee and they rewrote the district. They redrew the district lines in such a way to lock out basically all of the African Americans, except for about 400 of them to lock out all the African-Americans except for about 400 of them and to bring in all these white people into the district because what they're trying to do, they, they were trying to suppress the African-American vote. Now this led to, this led to the U S Supreme court case of Gomillion versus Lightfoot because we filed a lawsuit against this and to retaliate, there was an economic boycott of white owned businesses in Tuskegee, Alabama that lasted four years. It lasted from 1957 to 1961. The Tuskegee economic boycott of 1957. And this is going to lead to the U S Supreme court case of Gomillion versus Lightfoot because we were, we were fighting back and African-Americans had a higher literacy rate in Alabama, in, in, in Tuskegee. We had a higher literacy rate than white people in, in Tuskegee, Alabama. But you're trying to suppress our vote. It was the state legislature that tried to suppress our vote. Okay, now we'll go to the phone lines in just a minute here. Um, the in, in a speech to Congress, March 15, 1965, President Johnson outlined the devious ways in which election officials denied African Americans uh, the vote. Okay, the, the, the different obstacles they put in the way of us voting now um and then they had a literacy test as well now when they put these obstacles in the way it 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 didn't say that um only black people had to take literacy tests they just put these obstacles in the way and they just didn't enforce them usually for white people that's what happened they just didn't enforce them usually for white people in mississippi you had to be able to um, explain to the satisfaction of the registrar one of the, I think it was something like 250 parts to the Mississippi State Constitution. You had to be able to explain to them uh, whatever part of the Mississippi State Constitution they wanted you to explain to them to be able to vote. Now, a lot of times they were, a lot of times the registrar was functionally illiterate or what have you. But you, th these, these are the obstacles they put in the way of us voting. Now, uh, President Johnson also told Congress that voting officials, primarily in southern states, had been known to force black voters to recite the entire Constitution, U.S. Constitution, or explain the most complex provisions of state laws, a task most white voters would have been hard-pressed to accomplish. 
okay and e e e even the ones who could read even the white voters who could read they'd be hard pressed to uh hard pressed to accomplish that because all of them couldn't read in some cases even african americans with college degrees were turned away from the voting polls now although the voting rights act passed state and local enforcement of the law was weak and it was often outright ignored mainly in the south and in areas where the proportion of african americans in the population was high and their vote threatened the political status quo still the voting rights act gave african american voters the legal means to challenge voting restrictions and vastly improved voter turnout in mississippi alone voter turnout among african americans increased from six percent in 1964 to 59 percent in 1969 and increased from six percent in 1954 to uh uh six percent in 1954 let me switch back over to this here okay uh to 59 percent in uh 1969 all right that's a huge that's increased by 53 percent just in five years in 1970 president richard nixon extended the provisions of the voting rights act and lowered the eligible voting age for all voters to 18. that's that was the 26th amendment uh that's the 26th amendment to the u.s constitution all right let's go quickly here to the phone lines let's go to jerry uh uh line one welcome to the african history network show jerry thanks for calling uh thanks for holding uh, go ahead go ahead with your question or comment tell us where you're calling from yeah gary from new jersey gary okay gary from new jersey okay they put jerry here uh okay go ahead quickly gary oh yeah um i just want to note the uh, number one as far as the supreme court the first um 57 judges that were appointed to the united states supreme court were slave slaveholders, slave owners. Mm -hmm. And so um, we um, just, as far as just the, the same logic that you expect a savage people like the European to teach you how to um, take control, of, you know, like we rely on them as far as teaching our history. We got to, um, you know, get out of that uh, mode start being self-reliant, you know, self um, determine our own destiny, because they, I mean, the system is, you know, you can't, I mean, I heard you say before, like, as far as legally, like, that Europeans outlawed um, transatlantic slave trade in 18... 07 or something like that to that yeah when it yeah went to effect january 1st 1808 that's that's bringing africans into the country to enslave them yeah that's not that's not the domestic slave trade that's bringing africans into the country yeah, to enslave so, them a, so what you're saying as a legal basis that like you you know you, you're relying on savage or semi-savage people whatever like they um just like the constitution that they they said that um, African Americans like weren't really 100% um, human, like we were semi. They classified us like as being subhuman. So, therefore, how can you rely on anything that they say? That, that, that's, being, that's not what the Constitution or, said. You're referring to Article 1, Section 2, Clause 3 of the U.S. Constitution, known as the Three Fifths Compromise. It says, for the purpose of taxation and apportionment. It was talking about counting three fifths of the population of those enslaved. It wasn't saying they were three fifths of a That's human true, being. Right. It, it was saying for the purpose of taxation and apportionment. Apportionment deals with right. apportionment deals with determining how many seats in the U.S. House of Representatives states would have. How do you count the population enslaved? Now, the population of free African Americans they counted the they counted the full population at the same time. They come with the full population of free African Americans. So that's a misunderstanding of uh of the three fifths compromise. But yeah, go go but go but 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 go 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 ahead. You got like 20 seconds because we're out of time here. Go ahead, go ahead and wrap it up. All right, but anyway, but the, all right, so the, but the net effect of um anything, the implication of putting something in the constitution to that effect has the same 
I mean, that effect is reducing the immunity of African people, like, you know, to have people think of African people as being subhuman. Right, right. Well, we were, redu we were reduced to subhuman status before 1787. 1787 is when oh, the yeah. philadelphia convention took place yep but do me a favor do me a favor we're out of time here gary call back uh sunday night we're on 9 p.m 11 p.m sunday we have two hours on sunday night okay call back sunday night thanks for calling all right all right everybody those watching on facebook and youtube uh keep watching we're going to keep broadcasting for a few more minutes we'll finish up this topic we'll talk about jamaica's independence and then also uh register for uh, visit africanhistorynetwork.com africanhistorynetwork.com register for my saturday course and sunday course from the civil war to the civil rights movement and black power uh right now it's correct wrong behavior is not over till we win we're kind of forever we'll talk to you sunday peace all right stand by everybody stand by All right, let me disconnect this call. Let me disconnect this call. All right. Okay. All right, everybody. Um, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can um, register for the class I teach on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power. Okay. We teach this on Saturdays, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch the uh, watch it over and over again. Uh, even after the uh, course is over with, like next year, you still have access to the course. Click on register here. It takes you to the next page. And uh, just click on enroll. And you can uh, enroll in the class and you can start watching the content. OK, you can watch last Saturday's class. So this deals with uh, history from 1865 to 1968, uh, the year the Civil War ended, chattel slavery ended. And uh, we, we deal with uh, from Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, uh, then the Jim Crow era. Um, and we see uh, a period of time of reversal of our rights. Um, we look at the. Uh, we talk about Mississippi State Constitution, Louisiana State Constitution, all that. Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896, U.S. Supreme Court case. Then we go into the 1900s. Uh, we look at uh, the Great Migration, 1915 and 1917, and 1970. Six million African Americans migrating from the South up North. Uh, we look at the uh, World War One, 1914 to 1918. Uh, red summer in 1919 we had over 25 major race riots in this country uh harlem renaissance uh, nation of islam universal negro improvement association uh unia marcus garvey uh dr carter g woodson and the association for the study of negro life and history founded in uh, 1915. we look at all these things in these different movements and then the civil rights movement uh, we look at Brown versus Board of Education, uh, U.S. Supreme Court case, 1954, Emmett Till uh, uh, killed August 28, 1950, uh, August 28, 1955, Montgomery bus boycott uh, starting December 5th, 1955. We go through the civil rights movement and then see how the civil rights movement gives way to the black power movement. So this 100 plus year period of history is extremely, extremely important because um, this helps us to understand how we got to where we are today and better understand where, where do we go from here, okay? But this period of time after slavery ends is an extremely critical period of time. So each class, this is a 10-week online course, each class we go through and analyze an approximately 10-year period of history, okay, to better understand uh, this history and and the laws and policies that were put in place and what happened to put us in the situation we are today and as we go through and study this history we'll see how history is repeating itself okay and if it's not repeating itself it certainly is rhyming okay if it's not repeating itself it certainly is rhyming okay so we posted a link here you can register for that and uh, uh also at our website africanhistorynetwork.com and then the other online course I teach is on Sundays. And this is the first course, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We do this on Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. 
as a 10 week online course as well. We deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So you can register for those at um, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. So we'll see you in class uh, hopefully this weekend. All right, now let, let me go back to uh, this PC. I posted the link here from uh, History.com dealing with uh, President Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act. I want to look quickly at this uh, article here from uh, BlackAmericaWeb.com. There's a piece from BlackAmericaWeb.com that deals with um, the Voting Rights Act was signed. Let me see, we have that here. The Voting Rights Act was signed on this day in uh, this day, 56 years later, it remains under attack. 56 years later, it remains under attack. Now, also, the other thing is a lot of our people don't even understand the Voting Rights Act. Okay. Or why it was why it was necessary. This is why we have to understand history. People's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past and the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. Okay, uh, so chief among the current issues at hand is the John Lewis Voting Rights Act advancement, uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, proposed legislation named for the late congressman who dedicated his life to the voting rights. Uh, now, the, the For the People Act goes farther than the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. John Lewis Voting Rights Act is, is not, they haven't finished writing that yet. John Lewis wrote the first 300 pages of the for the people act okay which is the most powerful voting rights act he wrote the first 300 pages of the for the people act and the for the people act restores the uh uh it restores the 1965 voting rights act if passed it will restore the uh restore and strengthen uh section five of the voting rights act of 1965 which was all but eliminated by the u.s supreme court case of shelby county versus holder 2013 uh that allows places with a history of voter discrimination to vote their way uh unless the federal government intervenes now specifically the john lewis voting rights act advancement uh responds to current conditions in voting today by restoring the full protections of the original bipartisan uh voting rights act of 1965 which was last reauthorized by congress in 2006 but then gutted by the Supreme Court in 2013. Uh, first proposed in 2019 by Alabama Representative Terry Sewell, uh, who's an uh, uh, African-American woman, Terry Sewell. The legislation has languished, languished since the last administration and continues to stall even as Democrats in 2021 enjoy the, super major the, enjoy the rare supermajority control of both chambers of Congress and the White House. That's largely due to the awareness of Republicans' eagerness to wield the filibuster to block any Democratic-led bills. Well, you can talk about a supermajority having the uh, House of Representatives and the Senate, okay, uh, as well as as well as the White House, but they have a slim majority in the Senate. It's a 50-50 tie in the Senate with Vice President Kamala Harris being the tie-breaking vote. But most of these bills, you need most of these bills, you need 60 votes to pass. Most of these bills in the Senate, you need 60 votes to pass, including the For the People Act. You need 60 votes to pass that bill, which means you need 10 Republicans to pass the bill. You need 10 Republicans to vote for most of these bills to pass, including the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. You need 10 Republicans to vote for that bill. So a lot of these bills, the 10 Republicans ain't gonna vote for them. Now, passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, uh, voting rights. So this is this is one of the things that people don't understand about the Senate. Yes, Democrats are in control of the Senate, but a 50-50, a 50-50 controlling it with uh 50 votes is different than controlling it with 60 votes. If you only got 50 votes voting, for, if you only have 50 Democrats voting for a bill, a lot of these bills you can't get passed unless you alter the filibuster, unless you alter the filibuster. And then you need 51 votes 
to vote for the filibuster to, 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 to alter it, any changes to the filibuster, you're going to need 51 votes for that also. Which means Senator Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema will have to vote for it. Because no Republicans are going to vote to alter the filibuster. Because they're in the minority and they're using it to block bills from the majority. So no Republicans are going to vote for that. Now, reducing the... Um, Passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act could be one of the few ways for Democrats to try to even the voting field that has been upended by the growing number of uh, states placing increased restrictions on access to the ballot. Reducing the locations and use of secure drop boxes for absentee ballots, prohibiting the use of mobile uh, voting to ease uh, long lines and allowing uh, for state takeover of local boards of election, like what has happened in Georgia, which John Lewis uh, represented in Congress for more than 30 years, will make it harder for people to vote in states that helped Joe Biden beat Trump uh, last November. And, th and th that's the whole goal. I mean, they're trying to take over Fulton County now in, in Georgia. They're trying to take over the Fulton County, uh, um, uh, Fulton County uh, 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 voting board, they're trying to take that, the state is uh, state legislature, they're trying to take that over now in uh, Georgia. Let me bring this back up here. All right. How's everybody doing? Share this broadcasting on social media platforms. All right. Now, uh, the article goes on to say to refresh your memories, the Trump administration in 2017 took deliberate steps to end the Voting Rights Act, including the Department of Justice sending a letter to all 50 states announcing, quote, we are reviewing voter registration lists. We are reviewing voter registration uh, list maintenance procedures in each state covered by the National Voting Rights Act and suggested a purge of voter rolls. Now, that's 2017. Jefferson Beauregard Sessions III uh, was attorney general. He was from Alabama, and he cheered the gutting of the Voting Rights Act in 2013 with Shelby County versus Holder. He cheered that. Shelby County is a county in Alabama. Shelby County sued um, Holder. The holder they sued was Attorney General Eric Holder. And uh, Jeff Sessions then became Attorney General. Okay, Jeff Sessions was anti-civil rights, anti-voting rights, all of that. And he, and he cheered the gutting of the Voting Rights Act in 2013. Now, on the flip side, Biden's Department of Justice has made strides to act by suing for knowingly passing a racist voting law that uh, particularly affects African-Americans, but is expected that's going to be tied up in court for two years, that lawsuit. Several provisions in Georgia's new law limit voter participation by requiring those voting by absentee ballot to submit a uh, copy of their ID, reduces the locations and use of secure drop boxes, prohibits the use of mobile voting to ease long lines and allows for uh, state takeover of local boards of elections. See, that's critical. See, they, they want to be able to, the uh, Republicans in the state legislature, they want to be able to overturn election results that they don't like. They want to be able to overturn election results that they don't like. And they're trying to take over the uh, Fulton County Board of Elections right now. And uh, Fulton County is the county that Atlanta's in. Now, uh, DOJ lawsuit, uh, the DOJ's lawsuit should suggest there will be others filed against any of the more than a dozen other states that have enacted at least 20 new laws that make it harder to vote. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland, who announced the lawsuit against Georgia, penned an op-ed in the Washington Post on Friday, August 6, pressuring Congress to protect the right to vote. In an op-ed, uh, Attorney General uh, Merrick Garland um, said on the anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, and we'll flip this 
go back to this here. On the anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, we must sign, we, we must say again that it's not right to erect barriers that make it harder for millions of eligible Americans to vote. And it is time for Congress to act again to protect that fundamental right. Okay, check out this piece here from blackamericaweb.com. The Voting Rights Act was signed on this day 56 years later. It remains under attack. This is by News One staff. All right, um, very briefly here, let's look at this. Uh, we'll look at uh, Jamaica's Independence Day. We'll probably talk about this some more on Sunday. And we'll look very briefly at this uh, article that uh, Herb Boyd wrote about uh, Renoko Rashidi. We'll probably talk about that some more on Sunday. Uh, if you like this type of information, you can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show or at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Okay, we're here six days a week. This up, so let's keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, uh, pay some of the bills, etc. Okay, dollar sign, The AHN Show. And uh, when you go to our official Cash App account, it show my name and it'll say Michael and then uh, show, show my picture there. These other ones are fake African History Network uh, Cash App accounts. All right. Uh, there is a tribute to Renoko Rashidi taking place on Sunday, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time that Hapi Talks is putting on. Uh, Brother Taiki Grant, director of the documentary Hapi. Uh, this is taking place. So let's see here. We have it on Facebook. Let me pull this up. Uh, where is that? Okay, I posted this on our uh, Facebook page, and also it's um, at Aket Tours. Aket Tours, uh, they posted it there. Uh, on Facebook, let's flip over to this here. You stand by everybody. Uh, I kept tours. And I posted it on our fan page, the African History Network. Hapi Talks, a uh, tribute to uh, Dr. Renoko Rashidi, featuring uh, Anthony Browder, uh, Drs. Leonard Jeffries and Rosalind Jeffries, uh, Robin Walker, historian Robin Walker, Camille Yarbrough, Professor Hunter Adams, Dr. Riketti Amin, and Professor Jane Small. This is taking place Sunday, uh, August 8th, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So you can visit Aket Tours on Facebook, A-K-H-E-T, Aket Tours. And then also uh, at Hapi Film, H-A-P-I, uh, at Hapi Film on YouTube or Facebook, okay? And uh, it'll broadcast there, and I'll be uh, I'll be speaking. I'll be one of the um, people there uh, speaking and talking about Renoko as well. All right, that's five p.m. I'm not sure what time is over with. I know I'm on the air. I'm back here at nine p.m. on Sunday, so um, I think it's maybe five p.m. to eight p.m. I think it is. All right, so we have that, and then. Um, uh, Tony Browder uh, shared information today how you can um, donate to support uh, Renoko Rashidi because they have to bring his, um, if I remember correctly, from the post that Tony posted today, Tony Browder posted today, uh, they're trying to bring Renoko's body back from um, Egypt. Okay, because he was there in Egypt uh, giving a tour and uh, they have to bring his body back. Okay, so I shared this from Tony Browder. Today we shared this on our uh, Facebook fan page, the African History Network. 
let me go over to this here. They may have information at uh, Renoko Rashidi's um, website, Dr. Renoko, R U N O K O, Dr. Um, So Tony Browder posted. Let's look at this, make sure people can read this. For anyone who has expressed interest in contributing to the efforts to bring Brother Renoko, Renoko's body back to the USA and his funeral in L.A., you may do so by contributing to the only platform authorized to receive funds. Renoko's sister, Carol Strong, has set up the necessary accounts to receive funds. A committee is working. A committee is working with the family to plan the funeral and more details will be forthcoming. Thank you for your outpouring of love and support. Renoko Rashidi lives because we will keep his legacy alive. Sincerely, Tony Browder. So here is the, and this is on, um, this is at Tony's, uh, it's on his Facebook page too, N.T. Browder. This was shared from Instagram. But it's um, Anthony Tony Browder and then Anthony T. Browder. Those are Tony's uh, two official uh, Facebook pages. So they have this. Let's blow this up here. Okay. So they have the info here. Okay. You should be able to see this. Uh, Cash app, dollar sign, Carol Strong. 2000 C A R O L strong 2000 cash app. Uh, it, it's dollar sign Carol strong 2000. Then through PayPal, uh, paypal.me forward slash Carol strong 2000. And then Zell Carol strong 2000 at gmail.com through Zell. Okay. And then also checks and money orders, uh, PO box four seven four nine. Los Angeles, California, 90047, P.O. Box 47479, Los Angeles, California, 90047. Uh, address envelope to Renoko Rashidi, but make all checks payable to Carol Strong, S-T-R-O-N-G, who is his sister. Okay, address envelope to Renoko Rashidi, but make all checks payable to Carol Strong, uh, checks and money orders. All right, and uh, Tony has his information at his um, Facebook page also. Facebook page is Anthony Tony Browder and uh, also Anthony T. Browder. Okay, now uh, let me see something here. Do they have this updated? They have this information on. Um, all right. You can keep checking this website, um, drrenoko.com, and see if anybody updates it, see if they have that information there. Um, then there's this piece here from uh, Amsterdam News. Uh, New York Amsterdam News. This is a piece written by Herb Boyd, uh, Professor Herb Boyd. Uh, Renoko Rashidi, intrepid scholar of the global African presence. Um, there, this is from, let me write this, August 5th, August 5th. Okay, there is an abundance of serious scholars in the African, in the African American canon, but few as intrepid, wide ranging and resourceful as Renoko Rashidi. When you have interviewed Dr. John G. Jackson, edited Ivan Van Sertema, and challenged the conclusions of Dr. Shankar the Jope, as Renoko Rashidi did, then your credentials are unquestionable. An obituary uh, states that Renoko Rashidi uh, passed on August 2nd, and yes, he passed, and yes, he passed our way, but his I'm sorry, and yes, he passed our way, but his prodigious research, his profound and endless curiosity of the global African presence is forever with us. Essential to Renoko's scholarship was the prominence of African culture, 
in world civilizations and he pursued his he pursued this critical foundation to the four corners of the world unearthing information that extended the studies of his mentors such as dr chancellor williams who wrote uh the destruction of black civilization dr john henry clark dr yosef ben yakinen dr charles finch and countless others to witness one of his lectures was to experience an exhibition of photos and artifacts to illustrate his phenomenal grasp of African, European, and Asian past and presence. And I've seen a number of Renoko's lectures live in person. I've seen a number of his lectures. Um, in the African presence in early Asia, co-edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, who wrote they, uh, wrote they Came Before Columbus, Renoko Rashidi notes that, quote, blacks were the first in the development of Asia's early civilizations. The hard factual evidence has borne this out in case after case, although the story of the black presence in early Asia is obscure, its documentation is by no means new. And the works of Drusilla uh, D. Houston, Joel Augustus Rogers, J.A. Rogers, Joel Augustus Rogers, and most recently, Dr. John G. Jackson can be singled out for broadening our awareness of the subject and providing a solid foundation from which we can move forward. Okay, so read the rest of this piece here. And here's Renoko standing next to an Omec head. Um, read the rest of this piece here by Herb Boyd for New York, New York Amsterdam News. Renoko Rashidi, intrepid scholar of the global African presence. All right, we'll post this link here. Okay, now uh, I want to go to this next story here quickly, and we'll probably talk some more about this uh, Sunday. Because it's been a long day, and I did a Roland Martin show for two hours today already. Then I had to get ready for this show. So uh, today is Jamaica's Independence Day. Okay, Jamaica's Independence Day, August 6, nineteen sixty-two. There's a there's a good piece here from uh, the Washington Post. All right. Good piece from the Washington Post uh, on Jamaica's Independence Day, women's a sprint team caps dominant Olympics with four by 100 gold. Okay, and uh, today in, in 1962, uh, Jamaica won its independence from uh, Great Britain. Okay, so if we look at this here quickly. From uh, the Washington Post. Okay, and we see the uh, Jamaican uh, women's uh, sprint team here. Uh, Brianna Williams from Wright to left Brianna Williams, Sharika uh, Jackson, Shelly Ann Frazier Price with the uh, gold hair, Shelly Ann Frazier Price or gold lime colored hair, whichever it is, and Elaine Thompson Hera of uh, Jamaica celebrate after winning the gold medal, celebrate after winning the gold medal in the um, in the final of the women's uh, four by 100 meter relay. So, yeah, they, uh, those are some bad sisters right there. So they won uh, they won this race in the gold medal on uh, Jamaica's Independence Day. That's what that's one of the things this article talks about. OK. 
So I'll read this piece here from uh, the Washington Post. And then there is a, I was looking for information dealing with Jamaica's Independence Day. Um, AARegistry.com or .org, I should say, AARegistry.org, which is um, a source that I was using like years ago, AA Registry, dealing with uh, African American history. They have some information here on uh jamaica's independence day and we'll probably talk about this uh, a little more in depth on we'll probably talk about this a little uh a little more in depth on uh, sunday Okay. Let's see here. All right. So J Jamaica gains independence from Britain. The Caribbean island um, was settled first by hunter gatherers from the Yucatan and then by two ways of Arawak people from South America. Uh, now we know Christopher Columbus is going to conquer uh, Jamaica in 1494, okay, in 1494. Uh, let me pull something up here. And there was an article I want to pull up. Uh, Philadelphia Tribune also has a piece uh, dealing with um, uh, Jamaica uh, celebrating its Independence Day. All right, so let's continue here. And there's a piece here from um, the Philadelphia Tribune, Jamaican Celebrate Independence. Okay, so you can check this out also. See, we're gonna pull this up here from AA Registry. Okay, so you had the air wax um who the uh christopher columbus is conquering columbus arrived in jamaica in 1494 and took it for the crown of castile okay for for spain uh king ferdinand and queen isabella he's conquering uh for for uh for them At this time, over 200 villages existed in Jamaica, largely located in the south coast and ruled by uh, uh, chiefs of villages. The Spanish Empire began its official rule in Jamaica in 1509 
and the formal occupation of the island by conquistador Juan de Esquivo uh, and his men, E-S-Q-U-I-V-E-L. Now, the Spaniards uh, enslaved many of the native people, overworking and killing them to the point that many perished within 50 years of arrival. Okay, many perished within 50 years of arrival. And let's see if we can pull up the Jamaican flag here. Okay, so the Spaniards enslaved uh, many of the native people overworking and killing uh, them to the point that many perished within 50 years of European arrival. Now, subsequently, the lack of indigenous labor was resolved by bringing in African slaves. They had killed so many of the natives. Uh, they killed so many of uh, the Native Americans um, that they're bringing Africans into Jamaica, but also these other Spanish uh, colonies as well. And they're going to start exclusively uh, bringing in Africans around 1518 because of the Asiento de Negros signed by um, King Charles V of uh, Spain, the Asiento, which was a license to uh, slave trading nations. It was a license to slave trading nations and slave traders to provide uh, African slaves to Spanish colonies the Asiento. Now, subsequently, the lack of indigenous labor was resolved by bringing in uh, African slaves. Disappointed by the lack of gold on the island, the Spanish mainly used uh, Jamaica as a military base to supply colonizing efforts in the mainland uh, America. Uh, in the mainland Americas. After 146 years of Spanish rule, a large group of British sailors and soldiers landed in Kingston Harbor on May 10th, 1655. May 10th, 1655. During the Anglo-Spanish War, uh, they, they landed uh, May 10th, 1655 during the Anglo-Spanish War. The English who had set their sights on Jamaica after a disastrous defeat in an early attempt to take the island of Hispaniola. Hispaniola is um, on that island, the western portion of that island, uh, St. Dominique is where Haiti is, the western portion of that island. Um, the, the English who had set their sights on Jamaica after a disastrous defeat in an effort to attempt to take the island of Hispaniola, marched toward Villa uh, de la Vega, the administrative center of the island. Spanish forces surrendered without much fight on May 11th, uh, 1655. Many of them fleeing to Spanish Cuba or the northern portion of the island. British colonial uh, jurisdiction over the island was quickly established with the new renamed Spanish town named the capital and home of the local House of Assembly, Jamaica's directly elected legislature. So as I've said before, you're going to see these European nations fighting each other over these different lands that they're conquering. Now, over the years, escaped uh, uh, African slaves joined indigenous survivors in the mountains forming a new society known as maroons known as maroons maroons won a war against the british forces 1728 to 1740 but lost the second war 1795 to 1796 in the 1800s slavery was abolished and jamaicans gained suffrage 
although uh, the British still held power. Early in the 20th century, Marcus Garvey promoted black nationalism and because he's from Kingston, Jamaica. Well, uh, well he's from he's from Jamaica. Um, it's born in, I think, the St. Anne's Bay. Um, but uh, he's from Jamaica and he he starts the UNIA in Jamaica in 1914. And then he comes to the U.S. in 1916. OK. Um, and he wanted to connect with uh, Booker T. Washington, but Booker T. Washington passed away the previous year. All right. Now. Okay, let's look at this here. Um, okay, I think it was St. Anne's Bay. Uh, he loves St. Anne's Bay. Yeah. Yeah, St. Anne's Bay. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's what I thought. St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica. August 17th, 1887. Okay. Uh, let's continue here. Now, in the 1800s, slavery was abolished and Jamaicans gained suffrage, although the British still held, held power. Early in the 20th century, Marcus Garvey promoted black nationalism and became the most notable uh, black leader of his day. During the Great Depression, um, workers protested inequality and fought the authorities in Jamaica and other Caribbean colonies. In 1943, labor leader uh, Alexander uh, uh, Bustamante, Bustamante uh, won an electoral victory and established a new more liberal constitution after world war ii jamaican leaders developed the government structure to prepare for independence in 1962 uh, uh bustamante's party won the election and he became premier the same year the uk parliament officially granted jamaica's independence and uh, Bustamante uh, uh, became the independent country's first prime minister. Uh, so uh, Jamaica uh, gained their independence on uh, August 6, 1962 from uh, Great Britain. We're going to post this piece here uh, from aaregistry.org. And we know that Jamaica's in the news, um, has been in the news recently because they're preparing, preparing a petition to submit to Great Britain and Queen Elizabeth II demanding reparations. All right. Uh, be sure to register for the new 10 week online course I teach on Saturdays. Uh, 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. From the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. This is a 10-week online course. Uh, we do do the classes live. All the sessions are recorded. You can So they're on demand. You can go back and watch the sessions as much as you want to. Even after the 10-week course is over with, you'll still have access. You can go back and watch the classes. This is 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Saturday. Click uh, visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Scroll down the page. You'll see the information for the class. Click on register here. It takes you to the next page. Click on enroll. And as soon as you register, you can start watching uh, the course content. You can watch last, uh, last Saturday's class. Click right here on enroll. The class is uh, on sale $80. As a bonus, you'll get the uh, two and a half hour lecture I did on uh, what was that June 16th 2021 dealing with the real history of 
uh, Juneteenth. The two and a half hour presentation I did. So look, we'll post the link here. And uh, all of my lectures and uh, uh, digital downloads are available at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can also support us through uh, Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN Show through Cash App, and also through PayPal, PayPal.me forward slash the AHN Show. So let's so keep doing the research and stay on the air six days a week, keep broadcasting. All right, we have to get out of here. Um, we'll be back Sunday. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Because right now, it's, right now, it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And uh, we'll talk to you uh, Sunday. Peace.